Hello everybody, I'm Charles Landry and I want to tell you a bit about the way I think about cities. And by the way, I'm not an urban planner, I'm not an architect or anything like that. I studied politics, history and economics and was really interested in culture because I lived in a number of countries, Germany, Italy and England, where I've been most of the time. And that really shaped the way I think because I kept on thinking, how can you look at it through the eyes of different cultures, a city in this case, and what can I learn from that? And so what that does to you, in a sense, it makes you think, well, why are people walking around this way? Why are people doing this in that way? How do they gather and have a drink and eat? Or how do they work? How do they get to work? What are their life patterns and all of that? Now that's just, part of my background before I even got involved in cities. And indeed, initially, my inspiration was not necessarily to be a city person. It was just thinking about, hey, there's lots of interesting people out there. I'm really curious about them. Shall I look at them or shall I look at how they fit together when they're in an organization? And then after a while, I thought, hey, let's look at the city. That's nice and complex. Lots of cultures coming together, lots of attitudes, people's views and so on. So what then happened is that over time, I felt there are so many people who didn't really fulfill their complete potential. And that got me into the idea of creativity, ultimately creative cities and so on. And I was looking at, you know, things about arts and culture and aesthetics and all of that. But then over time, the creative city idea essentially has a number of features. But the main thing in one sentence is how do you, in a world of dramatic change, create the conditions for people, organizations and the city as a whole to think, plan and act with imagination? Now, initially, when the idea took off a bit, you know, I developed it in the very late 80s. And after about 10, 15 years, people said, oh, this is a bit interesting. Before that, they thought it was just vague and only about artistic creativity. But I was always interested in the whole potential of people and how they lived in their city, how they tried to make their urban experience better. So it took a long time and there was a very fortunate moment when Bill Bow asked me and said, can you measure the creativity of the city? Is there a methodology? What's the theory? All those sort of questions. And I thought, great, that's good. Okay, I'll try to put my thoughts together. And with a friend, my a very old friend, uh, we together developed something called the Creative City Index. And that has essentially four clusters of ideas that we explore and we do through interviews, through uh, questionnaires, surveys, research that already exists. And the four clusters are, what, how do you identify and nurture talent potential? How do you generate a learning environment? What are the things that happen there? How participative is this city? How accessible? for people so that they can make more of themselves. The second big cluster of things we look at is what is the, I suppose, the political regime or the incentives and regulations regime? Is that public sector entity essentially that usually governs a city, is it providing the opportunities for people to express their full potential? Is it encouraging them? Is it blocking them? Is it easy to do things or difficult? The third big cluster of things we looked at or look at is how do you communicate and bring it together? How do you harness and exploit all of that potential that always exists in a city, but usually, unfortunately, is dampened to some extent? So that's the third cluster of things we look at. The fourth is then to ask, well, what is the lived experience of the city? Is it a place that actually encourages you to be the best you can be? Is it something that pushes you inside yourself that you feel, I can't contribute? Is the physical 
design of the place, one that encourages you to feel open hearted and so on. Is it connected enough? You know, are there transport systems and all the things like that that allow you easily to get from A to B without having lots of barriers? We all know about ugly cities, cities that make us feel a bit depressed, the roads are too wide. You know, if you're a pedestrian, you have to basically go through an obstacle course and so on. So this was or is the Creative City Index framework, which is an important framework to me. Now, again, people say, well, what's the method? Actually, I've got an even simpler method. And I always say, does this city say yes or no? Is it more towards a yes, I emotionally satisfactory, giving your senses a good feeling? Or is it more a no, which makes you feel, oh, I don't want to communicate. Because if you've got a yes place, you're more open, you're more socially at ease, and probably also less tribal. So that's a big thing in terms of my particular methodology. Now, within that, of course, there is the idea of urban literacy. And what I mean by urban literacy is the ability to read the sign systems of the city. So that could be precisely the things I said at the beginning. How do people walk? How do they eat? How do they shop? What do they do? What are the rituals? What are the things that make them feel great? Are they spiritual? I mean, are they very religious or are they less religious? Or do they treat their, I don't know, their churches and mosques and everything in a good way? Or do they feel, oh, that's part of the old age? Or do they have other new rituals that are invented through festivals and so on? Now, urban literature, literature or literacy, sorry, is something that is an underlying, you could call it platform, that is a question I also ask in the context of the Creative City Index. It's a sort of background uh, that I have and carry with me. Because when you're doing research about cities, one thing you need to be is incredibly curious. If you're not curious about people, if you're not curious about places, if you're not observant and all of that. Now, I'm not saying I'm the most observant person in the world, but I do love speaking to people, trying to communicate with them. And through that, you get to know a place. And often the people you need to have that help you are a combination of ordinary citizens, anthropologists, journalists. It's not just the planner. All these people are important, but it's them together that makes uh, the thing much richer. Now, over time, I felt, uh, and this was, I think, 2003, I felt there's one thing missing when people talked about creativity. They often thought, okay, We've got these hipstery arts people. Yeah, we've got web designers and all of that. And of course, that's quite a narrow thing because urban innovation and in a sense, encouraging the city to be interesting and the best it can be involves also business innovations, perhaps. It involves uh, social innovations, all sorts of things. And there are many examples one could give of these types of things that we know and see across the world. So I felt that there's one thing missing. And in order to make a place work, you need a public administration that is functioning well. And we could have said, or I could have said at the time, oh, all the public administration is negative. They're all boring people who've got no knowledge and then whatever, anyway basically negative things. But I thought, no, 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 no. Look, there are millions, I think 80 million public servants in Europe, which includes teachers and many other people. And so I thought, well, this area of the bureaucracy, and I'm using the word bureaucracy in a positive sense, I thought, let's call this thing the creative bureaucracy. And what that's intending to do is to send a signal to that bureaucrat that they can be imaginative too. And often indeed there are, just like in corporations and elsewhere, there are obviously some bureaucrats who just are looking at the watch and saying, 
ah, okay, I'm going home now in a minute. And there are others who say, when you ask them at five o'clock, will you help me? They say no. But when you have a good system, and when the system isn't imprisoning the individual public administrator, then you find that that person, when I ask them, or that someone asks them, says, oh, would you just help me with this work? It's five o'clock, I know. They will say, of course I will. Because a good environment, a good physical environment, a good, let's call it um, social environment, a good atmosphere, really generates something value added. Now, at the same time, I'm aware with this idea of the creative bureaucracy that there are, of course, massive problems. But if you're psychologically wanting to change people, if you said something like innovation and governance reform because the bureaucracy is so useless, get these bloody bureaucrats to change, it's less likely to create the changes that you want. So this is why the approach I'm adopting, and it's so ironic because I actually don't work in a bureaucracy. The only two bureaucracies I've worked with, once as a very young man at the European Union, and once as a slightly older man for a year at the World Bank. So I've basically got not much experience, except that all my work is dealing with bureaucracy. So I do have indirect experience, which is why when I wrote the book, I got a good friend of mine to do it with me, who had been a senior bureaucrat for 25 years. So the whole idea of the creative bureaucracy is to generate again the enabling conditions for a city to be able to plan well, to be planned well and to operate well. So in a sense, you could say, well, what is the research? What is the method? This is more an advocacy program that, of course, has research in it in the sense that we're looking across the world at all the good examples of interesting public institutions doing amazing stuff and so on. So that's a certain sort of research. It's not sort of original research. It's more the gathering type of research. But then a bit later, a friend of mine um, called Chris Murray and I, by the way, the woman who co-wrote the book of the Creative Bureaucracy is called Margie Korst. Anyway, back to the psychology theme. Uh, a friend of mine called Chris Murray and I, we've been interested in psychology for a long time. And actually, when I was very young, when I was about 14, I used to read psychology books all the time. And then when I was 16, I never touched one again until about 40 years later. <laughs> But the point being, the key question is, we all know and we affect the city as individuals in terms of how we behave and what we do. But the city, in terms of its physical construct, how it looks and feels, affects us. I mean, Winston Churchill ironically said at one point, he said, we create the city and then the city creates us, which is the same point. So the point about the psychology and the city idea, which I do think is slightly more research in the more, I suppose, looking at the more deeply, less just gathering good examples, is looking at all those disciplines and psychology, I don't need to tell you, has got so many facets, there's so many schools and all of that. Our simple message is within all of these schools, and I don't want to talk about positive psychology, nudge theory, all of these things, archetypal psychology. I have my own views on which psychology I personally find interesting, but that's irrelevant. The main point for us was to say, here is some knowledge that the world, the city, city makers, are not actually tapping into. And therefore, they often don't understand how the city operates. If we understood more about what people think and how they plan and how they act, and if we could decode that with this richer understanding, this psychological understanding, we would create better places. And of course, there are other forms of knowledge, you know, understanding about sociology and all of these sorts of things. That's all completely true. So for me, then, if you then add these things together, they still form part of this idea, this core idea, which is, I'm saying, urban literacy. So the urban literacy would say, if you're walking down the street, would say, oh, these signs are like this. 
they're making me psychologically go inward. So we've got that link between urban psychology and urban literacy. So for me, the overarching concept could be, we could say, is to develop the notion of urban literacy. Now, the question is, how does that all fit into the idea of the city as a classroom? I hope indirectly, I've actually said the city is a classroom. If a classroom is about places which give you knowledge and provide you insights, then who is the person who's doing it? On the one hand, the city is not the teacher, but the object or the thing, that gives you insights or not, but it's an interactive process and that's the main thing. So I come back always to the notion of we affect the city and the city affects us. Um, literacy helps us understand that and that is how I would define a classroom. So anyway, good luck with everything you're doing. There we are.